Welcome to Construction Cashflow. I'm your host, Stu Davidson. And if you haven't already done so, hit the subscribe button so you never miss an episode. I mean, if you look at it fundamentally, if somebody is doing a job, they should not be worrying about whether or not they're going to be paid and certainly not worrying about when that payment is going to come in. That's a fundamental aspect of any commercial engagement. You know, in my mind, it's dead simple. Give the contractor a date for an application and tell him when he's going to get paid. Industry uh, does have this uh, heritage of, of payment issues. The payments weren't being made in full and they weren't being told why that was happening. You know, we're trying to become a modern industry in a modern world and we're still toiling away with this procurement model. We're still plagued with low-ball tendering and all this sort of stuff. This is why we're here. This is what we are all doing. And the industry has poor at its record keeping. It is still surprising how many contractors will sign something without necessarily fully understanding what that actually means. If you fail to prepare, then prepare to fail because you will lose this case. Prevention is always better than cure. In this show, we ask our guests to tell us their story. Tell us a little bit about their background, how they got to where they are today, how they develop their product, their services, their ideas. And we discuss how that can affect construction cash flow and other areas of construction. And also to give us an idea of how we might make things better and give you a few tips and ideas to take away with you. And listen to the end where you'll find out more about them, more about our guests, about motivates them what inspires them and hopefully that'll inspire you too and always don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss another episode in this episode i have the pleasure of introducing you to len bunton and david mcdonald len is an adjudicator and has his own consultancy in dispute resolution he's the former chairman of the Scottish Building Committee and works very closely with the CICB, the Construction Industry Collective Voice. David is a former Managing Director of BAM FM and Strategy Director of FM at Turner Townsend. He's now the National Programme Director for the Scottish Futures Trust, overseeing the implementation of the Hub Programme spread over five territories in Scotland. David also consults to the CICV with Len working together to produce best practice guides and surveys for the construction industry. So it's without further ado I have the pleasure of introducing you to David MacDonald and Len Bonton. Well good afternoon gents. Hi good Stuart. Up- Hi, Hi David. Hi Len. How are you, you doing today? Yeah, good, thank you. Yeah, good, good, thanks. Yourself? Yeah, fantastic, thank you. So I'll start with um, you, Len, first. Tell us a bit about your background and how you got to where you are now. Okay, I will do. When I saw your question, I turned cold because I've been in the industry so long, I can't even remember when I started. <laughs> but uh, it's all come back to me, it flooded back uh, traditional quantity surveying apprenticeship in Glasgow. Um, it, was a, it was a terrific experience because in those days we worked during the day and went to college at night and on Saturday mornings. Uh, you were out on site a lot. You didn't have mobiles, you didn't have faxes, you didn't have emails and you actually spoke to people. Uh, and to be honest with you, I'm a great believer that sometimes some of the old ways we did things should start to come back. Anyway, after that, I moved on to a role with British Rail in Glasgow, 
civil engineering department working on some modernization programs. I then came back to the firm I'd been with for a couple of years, uh, and then I was made an associate there. And I said to the bosses one day that I thought we should open a new office in Stirling. And they said, OK, we'll back you, but you need to bring in a project. And Sod's Law, right place at the right time, I met a developer one night and he said, I'm about to build something. Uh, and I said, well, I'm a QS and I'm looking for some work. So went into the office the next day with all the drawings and said, goodbye, I'm off to open the new office. <laughs> <laughs> so I worked away at that uh, for a number of years and then sadly that partnership split up and I put my own plate out on the door on the 6th of January 1978 and built that practice up, took on three or four people, then purchased a share in our practice in Glasgow and we grew to, grew to about 50 strong with five or six offices and then I joined a London practice. I, as operations director in Scotland and got involved in the contract advisory side, which was my first foray into dispute resolution. Um, left that company and joined another one and did much the same. And then I was traveling away from a lot. The family were growing up and I wasn't seeing them. And my wife said to me one night, look, just chuck this. And I did. And just around about the time that the Hurricanes in Grants Act to come into force, I set up my own dispute resolution consultancy. And that's what I've been doing and still doing. I do a lot of adjudication work. Um, but my main thrust now, uh, Stuart, is dispute avoidance. I'm a great convert to mm -hmm. getting in, getting your sleeves rolled up and getting things sorted out. And I know we'll be talking about that uh, later on. I had a heavy involvement with the CIR, but I was chairman in Scotland and chairman of the Scottish Building Contracts Committee. Uh, so I've always, through my life, tried to give a lot back to the industry to support people. Uh, and bang up to date, I'm still working away. I don't want to retire. I, I love doing what I'm doing. And God willing, I'd like to be here for my 100th birthday, getting a card from the king. <laughs> I'm sure you I'm sure, I'm sure you will, Len. Fantastic. Yeah. David, David. Oh, sorry, Len. Did you? Over to David. Over to David. David, tell us about your, a bit about your background and how you got to where you are now. Um, well, I, uh, I too am a chartered surveyor. Uh, not, uh, not quite the same vintage as Len, but uh, so I, I did the, the kind of, um, you know, the university course uh, a sandwich year what they call in the middle where uh, where you well in my experience I actually learned more there than I than I did when I was a, a student um, understandably because you you know you're, you're in my case I was working for a contractor and you, you really are at the coal face um, but it was before the day of uh, mobile phones and computers and all the rest of it and um, maybe I'm just getting old but the the, the the simplicity of that the 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 fact you are sitting down speaking to people uh, uh you know the, yeah the technology makes a huge difference but you know there is uh, something to be said for that kind of direct contact and engagement and and i think also the uh the surveying profession was uh, perhaps seen in a in a different different light um I have to say, though, I um, then quite quickly within my career after qualifying uh, branched out into project management and then facilities management consultancy, which led to a 12 year period where uh, I went over to the contracting side and um, was actually managing, uh, running a couple of the, uh, the FM companies. In, in kind of the early days of the the um, the the world of of FM being a, a recognised uh, industry, if you like, um, I then returned to consultancy and then joined uh, SFT Scottish Futures Trust about uh, just coming up for eight years ago, and it was uh, it was an opportunity to. Um, look in the tool bag and see what was uh, had been going in over the years and actually realize that uh, the experience that i had in in those various um, uh, 
types of roles that I described, they, they were actually really useful for the role that I have been uh, doing for the last uh, eight, nearly eight years, which is running the uh, the hub program for Scottish Futures Trust. Um, the, the hub program is essentially a, a program which uh, is involved in developing and delivering community infrastructure. So it's health facilities, education facilities, um, you know, council offices, civic uh, amenity buildings. Um, and our role is facilitating the coming together of the public sector and the private sector to uh, deliver uh, these projects. Um, I think that over the 12 years since the programme has been running, it has delivered around 300 buildings and the program is worth in the region of four and a half billion pounds in terms of projects delivered, projects in construction and projects in development. So it's, uh, it covers the whole of Scotland. So it's a, it's a well, privilege to be running something that has such uh, breadth and depth and reach because the uh, the program is really all about um, delivering community outcomes. Um, but also the breadth and depth of the program allows us to introduce new initiatives into, well, into the, the industry that supports our program. And uh, particularly over the last three years since the start of the pandemic, uh, I've had the opportunity to work with Len and, and others within the industry to, to look at areas where improvement could be introduced and indeed other parts of Scottish Futures Trust who have been developing new initiatives we've been using the hub programme as a way to to roll these out and I'm, I'm sure we'll cover these as we go on. Fantastic thank you for that David. Now between you you've got a huge amount of experience and particularly the approach that you you both take particularly engaging on linkedin to promote change to promote initiatives and through the work that you're doing the organization that you're both involved in construction industry collective voice and the work that they're doing it's an amazing papers and some amazing research that you guys are doing particularly drawn to the, the work and the survey that you've done on construction payments and i know you've recently got the the results out for that and this being the Construction Cash Flow podcast, it's of real interest to, to me and, and the listeners. And there's so many different aspects that affect cash flow in construction. So I'd love to start perhaps with you, Len, to give us a bit of background about the Construction Industry Collective Voice. Really just start us out on what your interpretation of the results of the construction payment survey are. Okay. Well, before the pandemic, I had been, I uh, was a consultant to the Scottish Electrical Contractors Association and the Scottish and Northern Ireland Plumbing Federation. And when the pandemic pandemic came about, we had a discussion internally about bringing the industry together to manage their way through this. And within a very short period of time, I think we had about initially about 20 organisations joined, all the employment organisations in the industry and we dealt with the contractual implications of sites shutting and then later on the restart again, the remobilization, the health and safety and all of that. And developed, if anybody looks at the CICV website, the number of fantastic webinars that are on there are, 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 absolutely, are absolutely brilliant. Uh, so once that we were all over that, the decision was to move away from the original title and call it the Collaborative Voice. So we have all these organizations, we meet uh, every eight weeks and we share knowledge and experiences and a lot of activities. David and I are involved in the procurement side and commercial management. People deal with health and safety, employment, just absolutely everything. And I'm, I'm sure David will agree with this. It's brought together a, an enormous number of people and the talent in this is uh, absolutely amazing and the, the great thing about it Stu, if we if we go to the chairman and say we've got an idea to do something he just says get on with it and that's what happened with this survey and the best practice guide and dave has been a, a very big part of this as uh, his involvement in the public sector so david it's been a great success 
Yeah, th thanks very much, Len. It, it does go back to what you were saying earlier on, uh, you know, giving giving something back. And the, the pandemic threw people together in uh, an unprecedented manner where we simply had to uh, collaborate all different uh, people in different roles, different sectors to uh, basically keep things moving along. And of course, the well, the, the pandemic, as as it was three years ago, is is essentially behind us. But the um, but where we are now is, uh, if you like, trying to recover from the impact of not just the pandemic, but uh, you know other global global issues, and the solutions are there. Uh, you know, the solutions to the challenges are there in front of us if we put our heads together and make time to, um, you know, find them, uh, work together and and find what those solutions may be. Um, the This whole thing about working remotely on Teams or, or Zoom allows those kind of discussions to be set up very quickly. It used to be, well, I could maybe meet you in a couple of months or, well, we can't get him until the end of the year, whatever. Now it's, well, do you want to meet tomorrow morning or tomorrow afternoon? And, uh, you know, so many organisations have made good use of of, of that, uh, those facilities. And, of course, the expertise that is round those uh, virtual tables is immense. But the, the, the thing that... Um, strikes me is that the you know it's like where there's a will there's a way but one of the the, the big things is, is as len says it's like well somebody has an idea right you know get on with it let's let's get uh, get things done get them out there and uh, see what kind of improvement can be can be made and by having that widespread engagement with so many different sectors and parties uh, you know, there, there is a real opportunity to fast track some of these uh, improvements across the industry that everyone will benefit from. Do you see any kind of real changes in the culture of how money and cash moves through the industry at all? Well, I, I think uh, in my own experience over the last two months, it's been absolutely horrendous. I have never experienced so many people that have got absolutely critical problems. Uh, and we mentioned before this started about the recent insolvencies in the north of England. Uh, so there's a long, long way to go uh, before we, we get this resolved. But just leading into the, the, the survey, we were finding that anecdotally people were coming to the meetings and saying, look, I've got a, a member organization that's experiencing this and another one to say oh, they're experiencing something else. So we decided to go to the market with a, a, a 29 question survey we, we didn't get an enormous response to be perfectly honest but it was a good sampling uh, i don't think it told us anything particularly new but it put the focus on a lot of things for example that most of the responders said that they weren't paid the full value of their application very few of them ever suspended the performance of their obligations the payments weren't being made in full and they weren't being told why that was happening uh, only 50% of the respondents were aware of the conflict avoidance process. Many hadn't heard of project bank accounts. So that kind of gave us uh, a platform to move on to the next stage, which was the production of the best practice guide. David, do you want to say anything else about the survey? Yeah, the, the issue about payment, I mean, if you look at it fundamentally, if somebody is doing a job, they should not, be worrying about whether or not they're going to be paid and certainly not worrying about when that payment is going to come in. I mean, that's just, just fundamentally, uh, you know, that's a fundamental aspect of any commercial engagement. But the industry uh, does have this uh, heritage of, of payment issues. But to be able to help address those, we, we need evidence. We need to know, is, is it a sector specific issue? Is it, uh, is it a, per, a particular area of the country is it um does this sit with particular tier one contractors you know where where is the the root cause of this and uh, certainly in the in the hub program whenever we we look at this we we certainly at the you know the higher levels of the the supply chains we we don't we don't have evidence of of 
payment uh, payment issues, payment problems, but they they do exist. But it's getting the evidence, capturing the evidence that points to where that is happening. And of course, um, as you said, Stuart, the the industry is populated by so many small organisations, and within a you know a typical construction contract, there will be so many. Uh, organizations in the supply chain both in terms of its breadth but also its hierarchy yeah tier one a tier two tier three and as soon as you get further and further away from the the top level of the supply chain trying to pin down where the issues may be uh, is is extremely difficult the, um, as len said the survey didn't produce a, a massive uh, number of responses which could be pointing to a number of things that you know at, at uh, one level it could be well it clearly isn't an issue otherwise people would use this as a platform to uh, get their uh, make their voice heard but also um you know we, we have heard sadly just un uh, anecdotally that uh, some contractors just don't want to get involved in that kind of discussion because uh, they don't want to earn a reputation of being um, a flag waver or a troublemaker and thus lose the opportunity for uh, uh, for for tendering uh, uh, chances if, if that is the case then that that's really quite a sad uh, a sad state of affairs but again these are all you know anecdotal um, mm. points what what we need to get to the heart of is through gathering of evidence you know, what, what exactly is the issue here the other thing is is uh, again one of the points that came back from the survey was the um i suppose in, in one sense frightening proportion or high proportion of uh, cl uh claim submissions that go in that uh, are not are not paid in full now that doesn't necessarily point to uh, a problem above that, uh, above you know the, the the main contractor. It may be that the payment was um, was uh, reduced for legitimate reasons. Maybe there was an overclaim. Maybe there was some aspects of the work were not satisfactory. So you know, there's two sides to that argument as well. So. Um, uh, we need to do or continue to do more and more uh, more and more digging so that we can establish exactly where the where the issues are yeah. but uh, Len mentioned the, the the next stage in that and uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll go into more detail on that in, in, uh, in the discussion today the other thing that I feel very very strongly about as I mean conducted a lot of adjudications Stu you actually see what is going wrong and there's no doubt in my mind that a lot of the problems in the construction industry are self-induced because people don't do things properly, they don't do them at the right time, and it's fairly fundamental commercial management. So we set about to list the various items and uh, stepping right through from the tender process through to final account of what you need to do to make sure you do things properly. And we are convinced that if we can get this guide embedded into organizations and taking it on board and educating people that it will make a significant difference it won't impact on people that just simply don't pay a subcontractor that's an entirely different issue and i'm beginning to see a hardening of attitude of people saying i'm not you're not paying me i'm not going to tender for you again you can get lost mm. and i think that's what needs to happen Sadly, they'll just go to somebody else or they'll go to a man in a white van. But the, the ethos of this practice guidance is do things better and that will improve the way you run and manage your business. Yeah, and the guidance is uh, is written in a, in a way that, you know, if, if, if you just pick it up and read it and you say, well, that's kind of obvious what it's saying in here. That that doesn't mean it's being applied, and sometimes you do actually have to strip it back to basics and say, well, you really shouldn't be signing anything unless you've read, understood, evaluated, and uh, allowed for every single word in that contract. And it is still surprising how many contractors will sign something without necessarily fully understanding what that actually means. Now, obviously, uh, you have to make commercial 
uh, judgments as to how you are going to respond to what is there in front of you. But you shouldn't be doing that blindly. There has to be uh, an assessment made of every single aspect, every single element of the contract. So you've, you have at least identified what that means for you as a business. You can then still make a commercial judgment as to whether you're going to trim the price, but only from a position of knowledge. Otherwise, there is, of course, the danger that things will go wrong. And when they do go wrong, in, in those circumstances, they can go wrong very, very quickly and very seriously, as, as Len will attest to from you know the work that you've done, Len, in trying to help people is, uh, recover from those situations. A lot of the industry is made up of uh, tradesmen that have found themselves in a business, that have stepped up to run a business and they're employing people around them. And sometimes you find that they don't have the um, the experience. I mentioned, Len, you mentioned about education uh, around what it really means to enter into a contract. You know, even if it's a kind of a basic, fundamental understanding of how they can negotiate a contract, how can they uh, make sure they're putting the right qualifications in and negotiating those out, contract amendments. You know, all of these kind of basic things. I know you mentioned, David, that. It seems to be more difficult to engage the, 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 the kind of lower tiers. So it's OK. You know, they're very, you know, they're, they're very much on board in the, in the higher tiers. But when you get down to the kind of the, the actual uh, trades and the, and, the, and the work sections, it seems to be much harder to engage. Do you, do you think we're um, making some inroads into that? Or do you, how do you feel that we can we can a, sort of educate uh, that that uh, level of the pro supply chain and help them to to manage their contracts in a way that's going to be uh, give them the best chance of getting paid. Um, well, one thing that uh, occurs to me is that uh, you know you, you you might go onto a really big project and there will be one of the top tier ones who has all the systems in place you know it's it's a, a really slick operation everything across the board really good and then there will be the various tiers of su the supply chain and there may indeed be some very very small organizations uh, because of their specialist nature that are working on this very large project now whoever uh, walks in the gate of the site before they start anything they're ushered into a, a, an area and they will receive a health and safety induction and they will go no further until that happens now why do we stop with why do we do just health and safety and and it doesn't matter which level of the uh, supply chain whether it's the one-man band or a major tier two they're all going through the induction but the, uh, that whole induction process needs to be broadened to cover all aspects of what is going on on that site. The, the, the obvious one that immediately springs to mind is, of course, uh, quality and you know designing in quality from the from the start. And then once everyone gets to site, then there's a, a further area of induction, and, and that certainly does happen. But there are so many other things that could be addressed at uh, at that kind of induction level, you know, just before you go through the second gate onto the site and, and making sure that, that everybody is right across all of the, all of the, the say, the contractual aspects. The, the other thing to bear in mind, of course, is the, the specialist where it's one man in a van and maybe a few employees, uh, you know, to invest in all of the learning that is required will perhaps be a, uh, a a major burden on on his or her business, but that doesn't mean that it uh, shouldn't be happening. So there there has to be a way of ensuring that that does and can happen at all levels. Mm. And 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 the thing that is really important is that it's always far better cheaper more efficient to do it once do it right rather than 
not get it right and then try and unpick and resolve afterwards so so that is the way it should be you know that 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 early stage work len you 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 must have some thoughts on that yeah i think we're very fortunate that we have in the cicv the the funnel or the channel to tap down through these organizations to their membership uh -huh. and recently there have been an increasing number of members phoning in and saying i've got a problem here can I speak to somebody? I dealt with two things today. It's pretty straightforward. Somebody just needed to be steered through. Uh -huh. So there's an ability to get right down through all levels of the construction supply chain and, and help people. Uh -huh. that, that is a, a, a really uh, important characteristic of the CICV. It covers such a, a breadth of the industry. It does. And I, I went on to the website actually earlier and uh, there's some fantastic papers on there. And what I like about them is that they're very, very concise, but quite, you know, for the, for the guidance on the, on, on um, the, the construction contracts, it's a, it's a short read. You know, you can read through it in, in a half an hour, an hour. Um, and the information and guidance on that is, I think spot on. It covers all the, the key areas that you need to know if you're a contractor or a subcontractor. The key areas quite quickly in terms of what you need to be covering. And it was really interesting uh, what you were saying there, David, in terms of inductions and you go through for induction and, you know, the, the, the idea of the health and safety induction, the quality, going through the quality of the work induction. And um, we, we quite often wait to the end of a project or, or when something goes wrong, we bring in a third party mediator or alternative dispute mm -hmm. resolution. Um, but going back to what you were saying, Len, it would be, do you think there's a space for actually having that support at the beginning of the project where, you know, David was talking about the, in, in, at the induction phase? Yes, to go it's... through the contractual side, yeah. Well, I think if, if people buy into this guide and start to implement these changes in their business, and uh, you, you've read it yourself, some of the recommendations are very straightforward and, and simple. They just need to put them in place. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I think that's now given us a, a platform to take this out to the industry and to start work much more closely with businesses. We've, got, we've had inquiries already from people who've seen the guide to say, can you come in and do a toolbox talk, please, for our construction management and the commercial guys so that they understand the importance of cash flow to this business. And if they don't do the job properly, then, you know, the company will get into trading difficulties and they won't have a job. So it's in everybody's interest to do this. The, the other thing about the, the guide is it's not, uh, it's not a rule book. You know, it's a... It's a, a collection of thinking from experienced professionals who are trying to encourage uh, people in the industry just to stop and think about things that may, some of them may, may appear rather uh, unnecessary, but if they're not thought about, and if they're not thought about at the outset, then, you know, the, the potential for problems uh, will just uh, increase. Uh, the other thing is that when a project goes wrong, we all sit around the table and scratch our heads and try and find out why. But it, it, there is, uh, you know, how often do we uh, sit down around the table and say, well, that project went really well. Let's identify why that is. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are some projects where they, they go so well, nobody even remembers them. But they are the ones that are, they're really important say so well, why did that work so well mm. and and find that out and share those lessons that that is a big part of our work in uh, in sft and in the hub program is is capturing the learning and sharing it and hopefully it will either prevent something happening in in future projects but more importantly is sharing and embedding best practice you know that that is so important if we're going to see the the kind of improvements that we know are possible mm -hmm. i also think that contractors need to start doing something internally on cpd i was talking to one of the organizations today and they're going to look at the various podcasts that we've produced 
And whether you could extend that to somebody getting a certificate in commercial management or something, something to have in their CV that they've been through this, but uh, a bit of work in these areas, I think. Uh, and the terrific thing with these podcasts, I mean, they're all off the shelf. We don't need to do anything more. They can be, uh, they can be downloaded and somebody can get their teams together and say, right, today we're going to look at problems that are happening on a site. So that, that's where, we've, where the energy's got to go into this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was quite interested, actually, in the, uh, uh, the conflict avoidance process um, that was part of the guide at, at, at the end. Could you, I wonder if you could give us a bit more information about how that, how that works? Ah, um, I need to get my soapbox out because I have bored the industry to death in this one and I'm going to continue to do so. The, the conflict avoidance process, too, it was developed by the RICS a number of years ago who engaged with Transport for London who wanted to find some sort of mechanism to reduce the effect of contractual claims and cost overruns, etc. So they brought this process into place. It's, it's early intervention, so you cut off issues and get them resolved before they escalate into disputes. So there's been a good track record established with TFL where there were, uh, there were about 17 or 18 different cases where different guys and ladies were brought in to deal with situations. And we've, we've been kind of building in that. Uh, but there have been three stages of the conflict avoidance process. The first thing was to make the industry aware of it. The second thing was to get them to commit to signing the conflict avoidance pledge. And the third area was embedding CAP into their business model. And there's a, a, an organization been set up called the Conflict Avoidance Coalition, which comprises all the contracting organizations, uh, uh, the employment, the, the, sorry, the professional organizations, uh, organizations like RailTrack and TFL. Uh, and that's now getting a much, much wider reach and getting involved with the government. Disappointingly, only 350 organizations have signed the pledge. So there's a lot of work to be done mm -hmm. there. And I, I've had a number of situations where my clients have signed the pledge and we've spent a bit of time with them educating their directors and their commercial management about how this process operates. And in one case, we brought this contractor supply chain into the room and said, look, from now on, the business is going to be using CAP we want you to sign the pledge, and if there are issues arising on a site, we don't want a barrage of emails, we want to sit down with you. If we can't resolve it between us, we'll go to the RICF and get an experienced person to come in. That person can come in and make a series of binding or non-binding recommendations, and from the TFL experience, it seems to be that the majority of these recommendations have been accepted. But the, the key thing hit the nail in the head, get it out of the way, and get on with building the project and preserve relationships. You know, surely everybody in the industry sees that as a very positive way forward. Mm. So hopefully your listeners around this will see the benefits of this process and start to inject it into their day-to-day -day operations. David's organization has committed to the pledge, which has been fantastic. Um, as I say, we're talking to NHS in Scotland of uh, about to put some frameworks out to tender with the conflict avoidance pledge embedded into it. So it's, so, it's slowly getting traction with private and public sector clients because I think they have to be the drivers of this process. We have uh, within the hub program, there are five hub companies there, the, 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 the ones that employ the contractors to do the uh, design and construction of the uh, the projects, and all five have signed the the pledge. Um, I would say that of the roughly three hundred projects we've delivered, we've only ever had uh, one formal dispute, which is probably uh, it's, it's probably a number of things. But one thing I think is the the fact that there is so much upfront pre-project, pre-procurement work that by the time you get to the actual delivery, there's a, an awful lot of the things that could potentially lead to conflict are, are not actually present anymore. The other thing is the hub program is a 20-year program with a possible five-year extension. So uh, the, 
the stakeholders simply have to get on because they're all going to be there a long time. But the for me, the one of the aspects that is really important that is that whenever organizations get into formal dispute, and that, that that's not just construction, that could be anything, the 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 relationships will be um, uh, dented and by having a fast track way of dealing with disagreements then you can preserve the relationship there's much more opportunity to preserve the relationship and and after all projects that have good relationships will be good projects that goes without saying yeah i think also that i think there was a big step forward last year when the construction playbook was published and the cic have made it very clear that they support the use of a uh, conflict avoidance process and are saying to non-government department organizations that, that procure projects comply or explain why you're not going to comply with it so that's a big step forward I think also just mentioning that at the last coalition meeting, one of the major players in the UK said that they want to see the conflict avoidance process as part of a contractor's tender pre-qualification. They will say to them, do you sign the conflict avoidance pledge? Will you undertake to commit to it during my contract? And they will be marked in that. Uh, so it's maybe a case of dragging people screaming and shouting into this, but if that's what's to happen, that's what's to happen. Yeah. Who do you think should fund the uh, conflict avoidance process? Well, at the moment, the RICS don't charge the parties a nominating fee. The mm. RICS will take a proportion of the CAP professionals' fee, and the, the, the costs are split equally between the parties. But again, anecdotally, you know, some issues have been dealt with in two or three days, which... Mm. Uh, you know, avoided going to adjudication so i think it's right that the parties share the share the cost what do you think the key aspect of planning for avoiding conflict is what what sort of things would you would you include in that in that pre-planning stage to to avoid conflict um so I just explain what do you mean pre-planning yeah, so when um, I was just going back to David's point, actually, when he was uh, mentioning about uh, planning around conflict, when the parties get together and they're planning the strategy in terms of how they're going to work together to avoid conflict, um, what do you think the key components of that pre-planning process uh, would be? You see, I, I um, think that this is all about where the the parties are sitting down and discussing what well what is the project all about what is the uh the the required outcome the the why why are we here um it's and it's not so much about planning to avoid conflict but if you have all of that upfront discussion then conflict is going to be much less of a, of an issue and of course prevention is always better than cure and you know, far too many projects uh, have the have or, or you can see projects uh, happening where everybody just wants to get on site. Everybody wants to get the thing designed, but there is so much that can be uh, very valuable in terms of development of a project that way before you get to the drawing board. And uh, in our our program over the last uh, last few years, we we have been what I would say, uh, what I call going further and further to the left, where we are applying place principles, for example, to to understand uh, what the community needs. So it's it's not uh, well. We need a new school. It's this is what the demographics are saying. This is what the the wider economic landscape is saying, and bringing stakeholders together to develop required outcomes way before you start designing something and when you have that level of engagement and understanding of the brief on one side and the proposals on the other side and knit them properly together then the the ingredients for a conflict or a dispute are gradually 
you know, fill it out. And as I say, the focus on avoiding all sorts of uh, uncertainty will pay dividends in the long term. Yeah. The, but then conflict can arise in any circumstances and the ability to go somewhere quickly follow a route that, that quickly resolves that while preserving the relationships uh, has to be uh, you know it, it, it has to be positive because otherwise it's um, the, the the risk to the project that goes way be beyond just the dispute that is is there affecting the parties so yeah how, how would Oh, sorry, Len, yeah, go on. Some people have said to me, Len, this is just mediation. Well, it's not mediation. The distinction is you're bringing a highly experienced construction professional into the room that knows the process, can bring the parties together to find a solution. It may not suit everybody. It may not be ideal, but it gets it off the table and out of the way and you can move on. That's the distinction, I think. I like the idea of bringing parties together uh, to discuss a common goal, common mission, you know, maybe in a broader context, you know, what we're trying to achieve for our community, for our families, you know, to get that feel of actually we're on the same side, we're in it together. Um, how would you kind of reconcile the, um, you know, you've got a developer on the one side that may not necessarily be local to that community, and then later on, in the project, the uh, you know, say a finishing trades or the electrical uh, second fix electrical fit out would come into the project later on. Um, you know, by that time, the mission and the vision and the goals of the project are set. How do you then kind of align the uh, the mission, the goals of both parties? Where on the one side you've got one party that's been part of the project for a long time. And, and have got their investment uh, goals and then you've got the the, the local uh, uh, carpentry firm or the electrical firm uh, that are coming in later on with maybe slightly different goals how do you then at that point when you get to that pre-planning uh, between those two parties how, how do you how do you align those goals uh, if, if i if i could uh, come in on that uh, it goes back to this induction idea and also as i was saying before the before the project ever reaches the site every single person involved in it should be able to reel off the reasons why the project is being undertaken and you know literally writing that up on the wall maybe six bullet points this is why we're here this is what we are all doing and it doesn't matter whether it's the the in our case, the hub co or the developer or the main contractor, or it's the person just coming to clean the project at their end before handover. It doesn't take long to engage with all of the stakeholders, supply chain, whatever, and uh, share uh, through a proper communication or induction, whatever, what those required outcomes are, what the, the, the vision, if you like, for the project is. And if everybody is approaching the project with that shared understanding, then the the actual engagement and personal investment in the project is way more than just somebody turning up and says, oh, I'm here to take the plasterboard uh, junctions, really. Yeah, that's the task. That's not why you're there, though. I love so, the idea yeah. of the personal engagement, making each individual person on the project feel engaged, feel that yeah. they've got something to contribute rather than just part of just take, I'm just here to take this partition down or, yeah. you know, yeah. I really like that principle. We, we've all heard the, uh, the story about the American president going to Cape Canaveral and there's a guy sweeping the floor and he says, so what's your job? He says, well, I'm here to help get a man on the moon. Now, who knows if that happened, but it is exactly the kind of engagement in a project you want from every single person who is involved whoever they are yeah absolutely len was you yeah, going to come in on that point yeah um i'm going to make myself unpopular here but i'm not too worried about that <laughs> I'm, I'm beginning to get to a stage that i have no longer got confidence in the main contractor model of procurement 
because uh, you've got you've got a level of the employer and the contractor engaged and potentially arguing, and then the contractor's got a pile of subcontractors underneath them saying, "Well, I can't pay you this because the PQS hasn't valued it." So I, I'm losing faith in that process. To my mind, construction management has to be a way forward to be looked at, where you have professional contracting people building the job with no vested interest in the financial aspects of it and each a uh, package contractor is engaged by the employer now that interestingly enough there's a project on the go in scotland at the moment where a very educated businessman is building a facility and he and i have spoken about this for years and that's the model he's adopted and that the job is going like a dream everybody's getting paid on time he goes round the site every week and with and snags a job with the architect. The subbies are getting paid within four or five days. Performance is brilliant. So, I mean, the risk of more main contractors going bust and leaving a trail of debt behind them is a real p possibility over the next couple of years. Yeah. No, I like there is a move to construction management and you speak to the larger contractors, there's pros and cons depending on what their business strategy is. Some some will say that they like to because of their lending and their and their investment uh, profiles, they like to have the high uh, revenue turnover, you know, and, 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 and they like to keep their supply chain close to their chests on traditional contracting. You know, I might be responsible for the budget, but once that contract is uh, appointed from a traditional perspective, I kind of lose sight of the, I lose control of the budget within the supply chain because it then it becomes the ownership of the contractor. But with construction management, I get more of an insight to it. Um, one of the things I've been uh, kind of looking at recently is that you have one project sponsor that's responsible for shifting the cash flow through throughout the the whole of the project ensuring that the cash stays within the project because of course you know with there's a lot of robbing peter to pay paul there's cash farming money goes out of the project comes back into the project uh, but to make sure that the cash flows and maybe from a project bank account because i know you guys have looked at that so the the main contractors in the supply chain issue a, uh, a digital uh, payment promise down the line or a promise to pay they don't actually handle the cash but they sign off the works so the cash is then uh, delivered directly to where it needs to go when it needs to go a bit like the the blood taking oxygen around the body to the organs when it when it needs it but i think there is a, a you know an opportunity for main contractors to if they're coming to a project they're traditionally main contractors they own their supply chain and it takes a long time to build a supply chain that are used to working together so there were it's worth a lot of money if you put that uh, so you know you've taken years to put a supply chain together but I suppose there's no reason in the construction management uh, process where you can't pay the uh the main contractor something to bring his supply chain what do you what, what's your thoughts on that um then well I, I'm, a, I'm a i'm a convert of you know what you've just said i think uh, you know we're trying to become a modern industry in a modern world and we're still toiling away with this procurement model we're still plagued with low ball tendering and all this sort of stuff as David said, the client says, I'm going to sign your contract tomorrow. I want you on site on Monday, and there's no pre engagement. So I think we have to be much more professional in our approach to the contracting process. I've been following David Mosey's articles about alliancing, and that seems to be mm. a very positive, but also integrated project and in insurances. So we need to be looking at these sort of. Uh, procurement methods and see if that actually is the way forward for the industry or if it's horses for courses yeah david i was just going to say that um when uh, you know every so often this this springs to mind that if we were if we didn't have a construction industry and we were starting with a blank sheet of paper what, what would it actually look like 
uh, and I'm pretty sure it would be very different to what it actually looks like. Um, but it is a, a huge industry with so many components. And, and as you said right at the beginning, Stuart, the, so many small companies, there, there is just such a, a range of components and trying to, to change them for the better is not something you can't, we can't just tear it all up and just start again. But we do have to, as Len says, we have to, to look at all options. We have to look at all different uh, different ways. But but from some very specific points, for example, fair payment, making sure people get paid for what they've done, when they should be paid, things like that, uh, fundamental aspects of quality, safety goes without saying. We've seen some amazing uh, uh, improvements in, in construction safety over the last, say, 20, 30 years. You know, we, we need to, to, to just continue to be bold and, and trying to make these, these changes as we go. Yeah, absolutely agreed. Uh, Len? Yeah, that's true. I wonder if I can mention a couple of the headings in the best practice guidance. Yep. The old expression, records, 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 that is still an enormous problem in the industry. And what we've tried to set out is some of the actions that contractors need to take from start to finish on a job. And again, it's a case of being well organised and well managed and getting everybody to buy into the, the, the practice. And I mean, I say to a lot of people that call me in to help them, if you fail to prepare, then prepare to fail because you will lose this case. And, uh, you, you know, I, there are fairly simple issues. Like today I was talking to a client. All their emails are stored in the server. They haven't printed anything out. So if you're going to go to adjudication, all these records have got to be printed out and all that sort of stuff. And that, that sort of kind of drives me mad, that sort of thing. And the industry has poor at its record keeping. And I know that Sean and some of the other folks that contribute to LinkedIn on this subject have, have mentioned the same. Uh, and it's something that you know radically needs removed. The, the other factor is this. In the last six months, I've had a couple of adjudications that went back to contracts that were completed in 2018. And the responding party didn't have any records. They had ditched them all. And this adjudication just came right out of the blue. And yeah. they had a heck of a job assembling uh, information. The people that had been on the job had disappeared. Eventually, they got some information together. So there's an issue now that you need to maintain and archive, archive these records for uh, quite a while. So uh, we will be looking further at this whole uh, aspect of record keeping. I know there's some pieces of kit and apps and stuff like that that you can get. In fact, your last talk, uh, person, Peter, that was on, he's got an absolutely brilliant system. He, yeah, PVA. Yeah. He gets yeah. demonstration of it. It's absolutely magic, you know, dead easy. Yeah, amazing. And Peter would always say records, records, records. Yep. And and like yourselves, it's so important, isn't it? If you've got the right records, and I, I know you refer to it in the in the guide, you know, if a subcontractor's got the right records, then he is able to challenge uh, a reduction in payment. He is able to challenge things. But if he's not keeping the records, then he's he's not really he's he's up against it, isn't he? Yeah. I think another factor in the guide is a very simple process that we have encouraged, and some contractors use it as the use of a payment schedule, but that sets out exactly when people have to make their applications and when the final date for payment is, and that becomes the mantra for everything. And it's a lot easier to set the payment dates out in a schedule than unfankle the payment provisions in a contract. And again, I'm convinced if the industry moves on to that, that the issues that come in front of an adjudicator, oh, they missed the final date for payment, they didn't do this, they didn't do that, and of course when the lawyers pile in, they make an absolute meal of it. Mm. It's an absolute nonsense. The people that drafted that Housing Grants Act with all this stuff about due dates appeared in LinkedIn recently. It's just an utter nonsense. You know, in my mind, it's dead simple. Give the contractor a date for an application and tell him when he's going to get paid. 
Exactly. And yeah. all, the, all the gubbings in between is forget it. <laughs> yeah, because you're constantly working out, am I, is it two days before, two da you know, you've got all this kind of grey area. Yeah. I always say that contracts are written by lawyers for lawyers because that's where <laughs> they, they earn their money in the grey areas, don't they? But that's where we all end up in dispute. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Fantastic. So, guys, I'm conscious of the the time getting on and um amazing contribution some absolute gold nuggets in there great guidance what what's the best what what is the best uh, contact then for people watching the podcast and they want to learn a bit more about the work that you guys have been involved in where should they go well i think first of all they should go if it's in scotland they should go to their trade organization and ask for assistance or simply log into the cicv forum website and you can access all sorts of information in there with all this, the work that we've done. You know, it's all been done during the pandemic. We're just now moving forward so they can get information there. Um, there's plenty of people around. You see there's some absolutely brilliant folk on LinkedIn who are all supporting and coming up with these same ideas. Uh, but most of the trade organizations have a legal advisor or a commercial advisor that can point them in the right direction to give them quick advice I, th I think that a really important message is that if a contractor feels they need help then to go and find it not to try and muddle on uh, in the dark because you know this is a huge industry and they, they are probably not facing something that has not been faced by some other uh, organization and and the thing is to to just reach out there's loads of you know opportunities to receive the the, the assistance and you know just sometimes it could be very simple or, or it may be complex but the help will be there and the important thing is to to seek that, that help and guidance yeah i i think that's a fair point but i think there's another situation here i honestly think that a number of commercial managers or QSs as we used to call them, mm. contractors organisations, they really need to up their game. I mean I, I somebody phoned me the other day and said uh, what does this clause 25 mean in the contract? I said well you read it and you tell me. You know you should have, you should be absolutely red hot on the conditions of contract. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't need to be going to a lawyer to get an interpretation of something that is relatively straightforward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so absolutely. I think, I think a lot of work is needed done internally in organisations to sharpen up the guys that are running contracts. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the things that should happen in a um, an induction, you know, we were talking about induction mm -hmm. uh, uh, pre-start pre meetings, is to go through the contract and to look at each clause and yeah. under each clause, talk together about the who, what, why, where, and how of that, you know, particular contract. So both parties are aware of of uh, of the clauses, you know, and 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 together, you know, putting aside any legal interpretation of it, what does it mean to us, you know, what uh, so that at least we're aware of um, of we've been through it together. You know, we're aware of, and, and we've, we've actually been able to highlight any areas we're not sure about, any grey areas, you know, without, before, because obviously a, a disputes often come up, as you were saying, lack of communication, maybe uh, we're assuming what the other party, um, in, ha, we're assuming how the other party interprets a partic the particular contract. They may not have even read it, you know, so, so um, I, I, I think that maybe that's something that that can happen. Yeah, I think yeah. I think you're absolutely right. That is a major problem that contractors don't read subcontracts that are coming in, and they sign up to some absolutely horrific clauses. Some of the guys have been posting these on LinkedIn, as you know, and yeah. some some of the risks that people are taking on are absolutely crazy. Yeah, uh, it's it is absolutely, and and most of the guys that have come on to the podcast. Uh, you know, have pointed out the, you know, that 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 particular point. And I think it was Lawrence Pierce actually that uh, pointed out about the going through the contract and doing the high what, where, where, who, on 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 the clauses. I thought it was a great is a great idea. 
it's something they do and uh you know i i, I always say to, to 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 contractors look you know make sure you've got you know that contract because there always used to be that old saying didn't they oh we sign the contract put it in the drawer you know do you remember when partnering first came out oh we put the but it's actually the document that keeps the communication clear doesn't it mm -hmm. you know so we have to know every every ounce of that yeah absolutely yeah yeah well thank you so much guys for coming on um before you go maybe one inspirational and motivational question for each of you um or maybe two maybe so um if i may if you've got time guys if you've got a few minutes we'll do yeah. a, a quick fire round yeah so to you len first how do you start your day i start my day by probably making my wife a cup of tea and then a sad case i come in and see if anything's come in overnight and then i have a light breakfast and i try to get at least an hour's exercise every day david how do you start your day well i um i get up i have my my breakfast and then i go for uh, a walk uh, we're very lucky where, where we live we are very close to uh being able to spend time in nature so uh, uh i go and see all the wildlife uh, i listen to uh, audio books as i go on my walk so by the time i'm back uh, to the the desk it's uh, starting to get daylight and uh, i get on with the day but uh, that's something i've done literally every day since uh, lockdown began all those uh, years ago and uh, it's a great way to to set you up for the day yeah, you read so many emails. I've sent them at midnight. Oh, indeed, I, I read. I read them as I'm uh, eating my bran flakes and catch up with the news. You know, yeah. <laughs> Len, when it when are you most productive? I all the time. I'm sure, Safe. I think I. I think I am. I just uh, keep going till I've crashed into my bed. <laughs> David, when are you most productive? Well, I think the, uh, the the way that we work now, where we're we're always available, uh, that, I'm not sure that's a good thing. But uh, it it is useful when you get an idea and you don't want to forget it. So you might just jot down a few things, or, or even dictate it. You know, the the technology we have, you can just dictate things as you go. Um, so I I think the I'm I'm probably. Well, I don't know. Actually, I've never really thought about that. I, I, I'm I am a morning person, but I'm also a a, a late bird as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I think I'm, I'm pretty much productive whenever I'm whenever I need to be. I think that's probably the the fairest answer. So, Len, Len, tell us what inspires and motivates you. What inspires and motivates me? Helping people out. Helping and being available to people, particularly at the moment where there's significant mental health issues. Somebody said to me recently, when I go out of the office at half past five, I don't forget that I've got to get £75,000 in on Tuesday to pay my wages bill. You don't switch off. Mm -hmm. So being able to support them, talk to them, help them, that's to me is tremendously important important and i'm also inspired i've got a wonderful wife she's been an absolute cornerstone of my life and supports everything i've done and encourages me and she's booking cruises so i've got to keep working till i'm 100 <laughs> amazing thank you thank you len and david what inspires and motivates you well similarly i'm, I'm i've got a, a, a wonderful supportive wife who, who inspires me and uh, in terms of the the job, I mean, I, I'm I am in a very privileged position to be working with uh, a, a very wide range of the public sector, a, a lot of the public sector, and our program covers the mainland of Scotland and the the, the islands. And uh, the, the the inspiration, I suppose, the motivation comes when, for example, a, a new school opens. And the kids are rushing in, the teachers are coming in, they're saying, wow, is this all for us? 
You see, absolutely. Um, in fact, my wife Sharon and I went up to Shetland um, a few years back to see the Anderson High School, which was being, uh, uh, which had been handed over through our program, and they they had waited for thirty years for this new school, and seeing the excitement all the way from the head teacher down to the the the, the kids who were just just starting high school, so excited about what this was going to mean for them and i'll tell you what that that's wonderful you can you can buy that that's just amazing to think that we as a as a team have been able to help make that happen and also uh, it's i always believe if if you if you can do something you should be doing something and as i said at the beginning you know putting lots of tools in the bag it's time to take them out and use them and, and it is all about making a difference in communities. And, and that is really motivational, having the opportunity to be able to, to play part in that. It's great. Mm, absolutely amazing. Len, did you want to come in there? Yeah, I was going to ask what inspires you. <laughs> me? <laughs> what inspires me? I, I love to, again, it's similar to you, I, I love to help people. I, I love to see people pick themselves up, dust themselves off and, you know, people that uh, maybe have gone through a difficult time to get back on their feet, to get their courage back, to get their confidence back. Because um, we can all, you know, we all go through hardships and hard times and sometimes we don't like to talk about it. And I think to, uh, it inspires me to be able to help people to, uh, to talk about where they are you know so that they can then uh, start to um start start to put their lives back together um Absolutely. i i, I mm. recently joined a, a choir it's called the choir with no name and it's for homeless marginalized people mm. and to see the difference that that joining that choir community uh has on people we we sing together and eat together and people it's a lifesaver you know so i think to see that inspires me encourages me to 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 be just really be involved in communities that are supporting each other mm, that's amazing well done yeah well done awesome great to hear mm -hmm. thank you and just one more question then before we go and i'll len um so what advice would you give to your young self to my young self do it all again david uh, uh younger self i think i would say just maybe take a few more risks calculated yeah. risks but yeah 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 well thank you guys it's been an absolute pleasure there's some Thanks. real golden nuggets in there and it's really nice to get to know you both to get to know about your background how you got to where you are what motivates you and what you're involved in thanks so much well thanks, thanks to you you do a marvelous job with this it's absolutely fantastic yeah well done it's very refreshing to hear all this because well done thank you so much i'll i'll see you on linkedin <laughs> okay you've been listening to construction cash flow Hit the subscribe button if you haven't already done so, so you never miss an episode. And remember, the faster cash flows, the faster wealth grows. <laughs>